please. Yep, thanks. Um, and thank you. I would like to thank very much the organizers for inviting me to this workshop. I learned a lot. And uh, also, it's, it's nice to have a bit uh, more time so I can show a few slides on the correlation between uh, anti ferromagnetism and magnetoelectric coupling effects that I would normally have to skip. Uh, before I begin my talk, uh, a few short comments. So this, this is the week when the new Nobel Prizes are announced, and uh, no one has made any comments so far, so please allow me one. Uh, if you have looked them up, then you may have noticed that two out of the three winners in physics are from, from Switzerland, and as someone living there, I cannot help noticing that. It's not very surprising, though. If you look at this paper, Chocolate Consumption, Cognitive Function, and Nobel Laureates, <laughs> and it uh, shows there is a very clear correlation, and guess who is on top? <laughs> highest chocolate consumption, highest uh, density of Nobel Laureates. And uh, it's very clearly stated in this nice article that uh, it's most likely that in a dose-dependent way, chocolate intake provides the abundant fertile ground needed for the sprouting of Nobel laureates. <laughs> so, eat chocolate. <laughs> what is also nice is that there is this interesting uh, point that veers off the linear relation a little bit. And they speculate if, so Sweden should have 14 Nobel laureates, but they had 32 of at the time of writing of the paper. And they speculate a bit if this is the proximity to the Nobel Committee or if they are simply um, respond more sensitively to the positive influences of uh, chocolate. So it's, it's a nice three-page thing and uh, especially this week, uh, nice reading. All right, so then let's uh, uh, start with uh, the um, uh, relation between antiferromagnetism and magnetoelectric coupling effects. It's a slightly different scope compared to the rest of the talks in this meeting, so I will have a longer introduction. Uh, there are lots of collaborators over the years because I have been working on antiferromagnets for 25 years about, a bit longer even. And uh, so from my group, a couple of people that you will see later on, so I don't mention them any further at the moment. Nicholas Baldin in our department who complements with uh, the theory on magnetoelectric coupling effects in oxides. Uh, then a couple of people, Michel Kenzelmann, Naomi Leo, Jonathan White at uh, Paul Scherrer Institute, and theory support, Andres Kano, samples, Tsuyoshi Kimura, and other people like Dennis Meyer from Trondheim and uh, Matsubara-san from Sendai. Okay, and of course, financial subsidy from ETH, from the Swiss National Fund, fund and uh, from the ERC. Good. So first, a few words on the magnetoelectric coupling and antiferromagnetism. So how are they related? <coughs> um, so the three basic forces that are typically discussed are electric fields, magnetic fields, or stress, as a mechanical one. And if they are applied to matter, then matter responds. So there is a magnetization in the magnetic field. There is a polarization in the electric field. There is strain under stress. Uh, that's not all, however. So there are cross correlations. For example, a stress can induce an electric polarization, which gets us to the piezoelectric effect. Uh, the one that is now rather popular for obvious reasons is the magnetoelectric coupling, so a magnetic phenomena in general somehow being related to an electric polarization or electric field somehow being related to uh, magnetization or spin effects in, in, in general. Why this is so interesting uh, is uh, noted here. So if you can apply an electric field and control magnetic order, that may allow you to build memory concepts uh, that save a lot of energy because for controlling magnetic bits usually you need a magnetic field that requires a current flowing, there's waste heat, it's slow, but if you can do the same with an electric field pulse, that would save you a lot of trouble. All right, so um, in order to see how antiferromagnets are related to this, let's have a look at symmetry, magnetoelectric coupling and symmetry. So let's just take something magnetic and something electric. So here represented by a rod magnet or the classical orbiting electron and uh, capacitance for, for electric field phenomena. Um, if we now apply spatial inversion, so we exchange R for minus R, 
then this would leave the um, magnetic phenomena untouched. It's an axial vector, and spatial inversion doesn't change it. But the capacitance would have a reversal of plus and minus side, of bottom and top side. So spatial inversion is broken by, uh, uh, or rather, electric field phenomena are not symmetric under spatial inversion. Then time reversal, which is an odd concept, but if you look at this classical definition of a spin, it would mean that the electrons are now orbiting the other way around, so time reversal is basically magnetization reversal. And you also see that magnetic order is not compatible with that. It breaks, in general, it breaks time reversal symmetry. Such a static capacitance, however, is left untouched. So uh, this is a symmetry operation for electric field phenomena. So putting that together, if you want magnetoelectric coupling effects, you involve magnetic fields, you involve electric fields. So that can happen <coughs> if both time reversal symmetry and spatial inversion symmetry are broken. OK. Now let's look at ferromagnetism and apply time reversal and spatial inversion. You will see that time reversal, yeah, it's indeed violated. So all the spins are turned upside down. Time reversal is not a symmetry operation for a ferromagnet. But in general, spatial inversion is. So ferromagnets are not, pre not per, per se a good candidate if you look for magnetoelectric coupling effects. And that's very different for antiferromagnets. Here, if you apply spatial inversion and time reversal symmetry, they are both broken. They are both not symmetry operations. So antiferromagnets, therefore, are the um, candidates that suggest itself if you want to talk about magnetoelectric coupling phenomena, not ferromagnets. This is also why many of the multiferroic, so those compounds with simultaneous magnetic and electric order, unite ferroelectricity and antiferromagnetism rather than ferromagnetism. Because only then, I mean, it's the better basis for having magnetoelectric coupling effects of any sort. And indeed, so the first compound where magnetoelectric coupling effects were discovered, um, an electric field inducing a magnetization was an antiferromagnet, chromium oxide, about which we have already heard a bit. So chromium oxide has a a very simple structure. It's just uh, an octahedral oxygen cage. It's a distorted octahedron. And in two out of three of these octahedrons, you find a chromium 3 plus ion. The spins of these are uh, up, down, up, down, or in the other domain state, down, up, down, up. So that's an antiferromagnet. And it allows magnetoelectric coupling effects of the linear type. So an electric field induces a proportional magnetization. Um, that was found in 1960 after it had been theoretically predicted by Jaloshinsky. I think it was, yeah, Jaloshinsky in 1958 or 57, I think. Um, yeah. So it's even not very difficult to understand the origin of this effect. So for chromium oxide, you can look at it like this. So here is the um, chain of up, down, up, down spins again. So each chromium ion sits in this distorted octahedral cage. So you have, so here you see the octahedron a bit better. So you have this quadratic plate and then the apical oxygen ions around this empty cage. Uh, the same here, but it's a bit distorted. So you have a larger triangle and a smaller triangle and the larger one is a bit rotated. The chromium ion is always a bit closer to the large triangle. Here, there, here, and there. Um, and also the, the spin of the chromium ion. In this domain state, it's always pointing towards the large triangle. Uh, so it's pointing towards this one, that one, this one, and that one. So they are all in the same environment, the chromium ions. So this is why it's a compensated antiferromagnet. But if you apply an electric field, then uniformly the chromium ions move away from the cathode. So that means that the upspins are moving closer to the small triangle here and there. And the downspins are moving closer to the big triangle, here and there. So that now up and downspins are in a different environment. That means they do not perfectly compensate their magnetic moments anymore. An electric field induces a small <coughs> residual magnetization. It's a very simple picture. It explains how magnetoelectric effects of this type can happen. There are many other mechanisms in general, but I, I like this one because it's so obvious. OK. Um, then you can also have it the other way around, namely a magnetization inducing a, a ferroelectric polarization. 
This brings us to multiferroics, where, which are discussed a lot for this uh, coexistence of magnetic and electric order. Um, a typical uh, structure that can induce a spontaneous polarization from magnetism is a spin spiral. So, for instance, of this type, this is rather a spin cycloid. So the spins rotating by a constant angle from side to side, and then you get the spiral. The thing is that this spiral breaks inversion symmetry. Exactly as I said, you need time reversal symmetry broken and spatial inversion symmetry broken. Um, in detail, it means that um, there is an energy contribution from the jaloshinsky moria interaction, which is um, proportional to the cross product, the vector product of two neighboring spins. That's always the same value because there's always the same angle of rotation between two sides times the degree of asymmetry between two neighboring sides. The degree of asymmetry, so that's the source, the inversion symmetry baking, the local one is the source for the jaloshinsky moria interaction. And it's defined by, well, this distance vector times the distance of this intermediate, this intermediate ion from this connection. So it's x, this deviation times or cross this connecting vector. Now you see that those that are displaced towards the lower part. Um, so here you get a negative energy contribution because this is negative, x is negative. So um, in order to have the lowest possible energy, x becomes larger or rather more negative. So then this energy contribution becomes more negative and that is achieved by moving these ions down. Here you have a positive contribution to the jaloshinsky moria energy term because x is positive. So X is made less positive. Again, the ions shift down. So in total, all the intermediate ions shift down, and then you get a um, resulting polarization. That's how this magnetically induced polarization comes about. There are compounds a lot uh, showing this kind of effect that have some sort of spin spiral more or less complicated. Here, for example, manganese tungstate. You have a spin spiral, and it induces um, um, multiferroic phase at rather low temperature and of a rather small polarization density. But nevertheless, this is the typical kind of multiferroic of this type that is presently discussed. OK, so we have seen how magnetic and electric phenomena are coupled in various types of antiferromagnetic materials. Now, how do we detect this? And this is also a little bit different from all the techniques we heard throughout the week. It's maybe close, most closely related to MOOC, about which we heard yesterday, the octopolar antiferromagnetic MOOC. Um, what we use is nonlinear optics. So um, we do not just use an electric field inducing a polarization, as you would typically have it. So we, we consider a polarization that is proportional to E squared. Or I could also consider one that is proportional to the third power, but usually this, this is enough. <laughs> so we take the simultaneous absorption of two photons from a light field, and then the relaxation in a single step. And energy conservation requires, you can also see it from writing down the frequency arguments, that the incident light then is at omega, the emitted light is at two omega. This process is called frequency doubling or second harmonic generation, SAG. It's extremely sensitive to symmetry. So, and this is why it's perfect for studying ferroic order, because any type of ferroic order breaks, per definition, some point group symmetry. Point group symmetry breaking is picked up by this process. You just have to look at the group theory, and then you will find uh, an electrically polarized light wave that is only there because you have broken symmetry by some ferroic order. So here is the first example in the literature where people studied um, second harmonic generation in the optical regime, 1961. So you see this, the idea was there for, for decades, but there was no equipment uh, to, to demonstrate it. And right after the laser had been invented, people went ahead and took a quartz rod, took a ruby laser, and found that if you shine in light at 700 nanometers, there's a small dot at 350, optical frequency doubling. And it's a rather interesting story that I once in a while I mention, and I have a bit more time, so today I mention it. If you look at this paper, this physical review letter, there's no data point here. Uh, so what happened? Um, in fact, in those days, people, when they wanted to have um, figures in their papers, they sent drawings. In this case, they sent a chemical film. The editor said, ah, there are dust speckles all over the place, so let's remove the dust speckles. 
<laughs> and uh, along with this, he removed the data point. <laughs> and there's no corregendum to this, no erratum, because everyone could just go to the lab and verify that this was a valid result. So it's, it's still the most important paper is wrong in a way. <laughs> And look at the time between submission and acceptance. So yeah, re received July 21, 61, <coughs> published August 15, 1961. This is amazing. <laughs> okay, so second harmonic generation on ferroics. As I said, any type of ferroic order breaks some point symmetry. Here, ferroelectricity breaks inversion symmetry. If you apply the inversion symmetry to a ferroelectric, the polarization reverses. That means once a material undergoes a ferroelectric order, suddenly there is a contribution to this frequency double signal, background free. So this is really nice. You, it, the signal is small, but there is no background you have to separate it from. This is a big advantage compared to Moog, for example. Um, and the same works magnetically. So here we have our chromium oxide spin structure. It also breaks inversion symmetry. It gets you from up, down, up, down, to down, up, down, up. So um, right at the nail temperature, you would get a second harmonic signal. And this is nice because uh, second harmonic generation doesn't care if it's ferro or anti -ferro -magnet magnetic, so you don't need a magnetization, and that's exactly what you need in order to detect anti -ferro magnetism. So that's then a typical experiment, light at frequency omega coming in, a sample doubles it, then you separate with a filter, you block the omega component, and then you analyze your two omega components with respect to contributions that couple to one or the other order. Here you see an example, yttrium manganite is just any, any compound that has ferroelectric order and that has antiferromagnetic order. So uh, at the ferroelectric ordering temperature, so first of all you see a certain spectral dependence of this signal and the signal goes away right at the Curie temperature, the ferroelectric Curie temperature. Uh, likewise, there is another frequency component that detects this triangular antiferromagnetic order. So in the terminology of yesterday's talk, I would call this anti-monopolar, because you have three spins pointing in, like a monopole, three spins pointing out. So in total, it's, uh, you could call it an anti-monopolar structure. But normally, I wouldn't do it. I would just call it an antiferromagnet. It's, it's a fully compensated antiferromagnet. When the order sets in, you have the emergence, the onset of a second harmonic signal. What is nice is it's an optical technique, so you can now take this light here at this frequency, for example, and image your sample onto a CCD camera, and then you get distributions of antiferromagnetic domains very easily. And these are 180 degree domains, uh, so the type that is most difficult to find or to detect. You just image it a few minutes and then you have a picture. Here is the, the oldest example of such a picture. So chromium oxide again with this up, down, up, down, and down, up, down, up, the domain states. Should be domain state, not domain. Um, so you take the second harmonic spectrum, you find two contributions. One is magnetically induced, or antiferromagnetically induced, the other one is crystallographically induced. The crystallographic one is why well, it changes a little bit with temperature, but uh, here the magnetic one, it goes away abruptly at the ordering temperature. So it's, it's a very clear uh, signature of the, of the antiferromagnetic order. You can now take these two contributions and let them interfere, and then you get pictures of antiferromagnetic domains in this material. Typical picture takes a minute, and you get the optical resolution of one micrometer. That is really a shortcut to what you would otherwise have to do, namely work with polarized neutrons, and then after a 24-hour exposure, you can get a poorly resolved picture of antiferromagnetic domains. This is really very convenient if you want to image antiferromagnetic domains that are large enough. Okay, um, yeah, so then let's uh, move on to the first example, what kind of uh, an antiferromagnet or antiferromagnetic systems we studied using this technique. Um, the motivation here were the experiments by Theo Rasing's group. We have seen yesterday that you can uh, have certain materials, metallic materials, that you uh, irradiate with a light pulse, and then, most interestingly, huh. uh, the uh, light pulse generates an, a, a reversal of the magnetization depending on the circular polarization of the light wave. That's a rather tricky phenomenon. It's still being discussed how that can work. 
Certainly some heating is involved, but maybe only electronic heating and not lattice heating and so on. I'm not going into that discussion. So what we see here is you can, all optically, just with light, reverse a magnetization in a ferromagnet or ferrimagnet. Question then is, can you also do that in antiferromagnets? That could be useful. So if you can just optically switch an antiferromagnetic state, that can help you to do a lot of interesting stuff, like uh, manipulate the exchange bias effect, or study materials with interesting phases, superconductivity, or heavy fermion formation, and just study the antiferromagnetic state, or um, manipulate it with your light pulse. And of course, there are ideas, well, I mean, the entire workshop is about how can you use it for data storage and smart applications like that, antiferromagnetism. So it would be nice to be able to control it just with light. Challenge is you don't have this macroscopic <laughs> magnetization you can easily couple to. And um, yeah, so we require a mechanism for visualization and optical control. That's exactly where our um, second harmonic approach comes in. So we took an antiferromagnet uh, of this uh, spin spiral type, terbium manganite. So here you see the spiral very nicely. And remember, uh, because of that spiral, you have a very small, really very small uh, secondary improper electric polarization. That is your handle to see the antiferromagnetism. But it's in a different space kind of. It's not in spin space. So you look at the polarization or you do something to the polarization and that is not so much. It doesn't interfere with, what, with, with spin space so much. So what we then did is we imaged this uh, compound um, at low temperature and found, yeah, indeed, we can see different antiferromagnetic domain states. We couple to them via this symmetry breaking. So we see the magnetism and the polarization at the same time because they are kind of one-to-one -one coupled. What we can then do is, via this small polarization, this parasitic polarization, we can polarize our material in an electric field so we can move it through an antiferromagnetic hysteresis by acting on the small polarization. So you see how these domain structures shift in the field. In particular, you can get it into one or the other single domain state, which is otherwise very difficult. But here, the electric field helps us to do that. OK, so now we take um, two samples, and uh, we get them into a, a single domain state, which has either left or right-handed spin spiral, antiferromagnetic spin spiral. And we irradiate this sample with a strong optical light, with a strong light pulse. So here we have our single domain samples before we irradiate them. And after irradiation, it looks like this. Where the laser pulse has hit, you reverse the, the antiferromagnetization. You can see that you really look at the antiferromagnetic order because uh, once you reach the nil temperature, it's gone. This, uh, splitting this contrast. So at first we thought this is super fancy and something with, uh, I don't know, um, terahertz generation that we do somehow in our crystal and that manipulates the magnetic order and so on. But it's much more mundane. So we did the same experiment with a CW laser. So the, here we used, uh, uh, what did we use? We used 120 femtoseconds. Then we did it with nanoseconds and finally with a CW laser, continuous laser beam. So it's not related to any high electric field component of our light pulse. It simply is the energy of the laser beam. So we heat up our sample. That is uh, not a bad thing. I mean, you can still do nice stuff with that. So what we think we have is we heat up our sample locally, bring it from this uh, antiferromagnetic and slightly polarized state into the um, non-polarized state, paramagnetic non-polarized state. Then we take our laser beam away, sample cools down, and the depolarization field forces the polarization and therefore the antiferromagnetic order to reverse. That it is like this, or that it can work like this, we also showed in Monte Carlo simulations. So here we have a sample. It's in the yellow state, so it's one of these um, circular spin spiral states. We heat it up by a laser pulse. You have a disordered state. Then it cools down, and when it cools down, at least in the Monte Carlo simulation, it would reverse its polarization and therefore antiferromagnetization. 
So in the computer it works very nicely and as we have seen in the experiment, we can make one switch. So we get from black to white or from white to black. We don't go back, however. If we do the same experiment again, we would again get a white point on a white dot on a black background. So can we also find a geometry where we can reverse it as many times as we want? And the design for this is shown here. So what we do is we work with two laser beams, one at low absorption, one at high absorption. So Monte Carlo-wise, the first step you have already seen. So we heat up our sample with a laser beam. It cools down. It uh, polarizes and antiferromagnetizes in the opposite direction. Then we heat it up with a second laser beam. Penetration depth of this one is much lower. So we heat up a thinner top layer. And when this one cools down, it again magnetizes and polarizes in the opposite direction, but now with respect to this originally re reverse blue layer. So now you get to, white, to, to yellow again. So blue, yellow, and depending on what kind of laser you use, you can set it into one or the other state. Um, one, in the computer it works very well, and also in reality. So locally we switch, flip back and forth our antiferromagnetic order parameter, and with it the polarization, as many times as we want. It's not a bulk switching, but in this bulk region here, uh, a certain thickness in our sample, we can do this as many times as we want. And we can also write with this. So if we write certain structures into our sample, especially if we write cross lines, then uh, you see that there's no crosstalk. So uh, it could happen that in this corner here, the material sees the environment has already switched, so maybe it switches as well. But no, you only really switch where, you had, where the laser beam has hit. There's no, no crosstalk. That is quite interesting or quite nice for any type of application you may come up with, of course, at higher temperature and other compounds. You can also erase the entire structure with the other light wave. So that was the first example for um, an interesting magnetoelectric correlation in antiferromagnets. The next uh, example I would like to discuss is the inversion of a domain pattern. So what does that mean? Um, what the starting point of our discussion here was, uh, if you look at modern, say, most recent multiferroics. So people have been studying multiferroics very intensely for 20 years. They were discovered long, 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 much way earlier, but the intense investigations began about 20 years ago. And of course, you want more, more, more. So now people want uh, magnetization and the polarization strongly coupled and parallel to each other in one material. You can do that, but that these are so many requests that you can only make it happen if there are lots of degrees of freedom to realize it. And lots of degrees of freedom means lots of order parameters, an extremely complicated magnetic structure. So look at this compound, manganese germinate. You have two types of magnetic moments, uh, processing cones, spin cones, uh, pointing in different directions and not even uh, along certain crystallographic axis, but somehow tilted. And this is all, don't even try to understand that. So uh, you can describe this with uh, two commensurate and four incommensurate order parameters. Again, this is very complicated uh, Landau theory, and you can go through all of that, but only after a beer or two. Um, yeah, so what that means is you have lots of degrees of freedom to realize your perfect multiferroic, but once you have all these degrees of freedom, just building a multiferroic is certainly not everything that you can do. So maybe there are other functionalities by putting, putting these order parameters together in a different way or looking for other kind, types of coupling that this massive amount of order parameters may permit, may permit you to do. It's a little bit like with Tangram, if you know this puzzle. So you can not only make one shape, you can make lots of shapes because you have seven pieces. Okay. So that was our starting point. So what we did is we took one of these, in this case the manganese germinate, we imaged it with second harmonic generation. We're able to see the polarization domain pattern. So basically this is an antiferromagnet, uh, it's a, an antiferromagnet with a weak magnetization and an electric polarization because of all these order parameters. So here we see the polarization. And we apply a magnetic field perpendicular out of plane and when we do this and increase the field, we see that the domain structure changes. So the ferroelectric domain structure changes in the magnetic field, changes completely. But most interestingly, if once you have finished your cycle, you get the same domain pattern back. But polarization is reversed in each of the domains. 
it's not perfect, but little details, they match. And the shape, their general shape here and this dagger here. So that's quite surprising. Uh, apparently, the domains are rather uh, flexible. They are not pinned. The domain walls are not pinned. But nevertheless, after completing your cycle, you're back at the same domain structure. You have inverted it. Uh, how can that be? If you look into this complicated situation with all the order parameters, you find, and I'm not going, I mean, you can do all the maths. That takes you a long time, but it, it boils down to this. So there is an energy contribution. It couples to a coefficient times a polarization, namely the polarization of this uh, state here, this ferroelectric polarization, times the magnetization you induce with your magnetic field. So if you now take uh, a magnetic field and you flip the magnetization between plus and minus, you also have to flip whatever polarization state you have in order to keep the energy contribution negative. So the direct coupling, because this term is just a coefficient, when you flip the magnetization, the polarization has to be flipped as well. So by cycling your magnetic field, you reverse the polarization in each domain. That's it. OK, then you may say, Naya, this is one lucky compound where this worked. So we took another one. Again, very complex, complicated cobalt terroride. Lots of spins in lots of type, types of order. And this is not even completely understood what the magnetic order is. But again, you have um, several order parameters. And again, the question, can you find some kind of functionality like this, some kind of inversion of a domain pattern? So here we have a magnetic domain pattern in, on an antiferromagnetic background. We have a ferromagnetic plus minus a domain, so ferromagnetic magnetization in the exact plane that points in the plus or minus direction. And here you see uh, the resulting domain pattern, domain distribution. And in this case, you cycle a magnetic field that is out of plane. So if it's out of plane, it cannot generate a single domain state in plane. Um, what it does is, again, that it uh, tunes between two opposite uh, well, between it tunes the same domain pattern, but between opposite directions of magnetization for each domain. And again, you can find such a term. So where you couple the magnetization that you induce with your Y-oriented magnetic field here, and you have the ferromagnetic, the small uh, magnetization in plane. When you reverse the direction of your applied field out of plane, you reverse the according magnetization. And then the magnetization of this ordered state has to reverse in each domain in order to save the minus sign of the energy contribution. Mm -hmm. so, and I, I would argue that in all the multiferroics that are described by complicated order parameter situations as in these compounds, you more or less always somewhere find such a contribution. So this inversion of a domain pattern seems to be a more general phenomenon. And of course, there could be other things like that that still need to be discovered. OK, here is just for, for as, uh, without further explanation, we can also do this by working with electric fields. Here we take a compound, this prosium terbium ferrite, and by applying an electric field, we switch between um, a positive, well, we, we exactly invert a ma magnetic domain pattern without further explanation. So it's really, now we have three compounds doing this, and there are certainly more. Good. So here is the general mechanism that we have to, for describing this. So we have the domain structure, the domain pattern we want to preserve. Then we have something, some other order parameter we can act on with our applied field, may it be electric or magnetic. The total domain structure then is, the, so the observable is then the product of the two. So you see that you can tune one between a positive, uniformly positive and uniformly negative orientation of some order parameter S, multiplies with the other order parameter to give the observable, and if you do this, you start with a domain pattern, this one. You go through a multi-domain state, and then you end up with the opposite domain pattern. I mean, the same domain pattern, but opposite orientation of the order parameter in each domain. That's the general phenomenon here. Uh, the order parameters for these two compounds, don't understand them. It's just I'm, what I'm saying with this is we, we, we really calculated all this, so it works, without going into the details here. Good. So then last topic. Um, in this talk, the conversion of 
multiferroics as in antiferromagnets, because as I said, no, so the multiferroics are exclusively, almost exclusively antiferromagnets. A conversion of such a multiferroic between two and three dimensions. Here are the people who did this work in my group. And um, yeah, so this prosium terbium ferrite, so the compound that I showed last that can be, where the domain state, the domain pattern can be switched with, a, with an electric field. So it has a rather interesting phase boundary at rather low temperature. Uh, so I'm always asked, so what, what good is it if you have um, a phenomenon that works at 2.3 Kelvin? Well, on the one hand, uh, there are other multifluids that work at much higher temperature. And I always say, okay, it's not room temperature, but it's about space temperature. <coughs> okay, so um, yeah, so in dysprosium terbium ferrite, you have two antiferromagnetic states. One is purely antiferromagnetic, anti so it has just a compensated magnetization. Slightly higher temperature, you have a weak ferromagnetic component and a weak polarization coming on top. So this is an antiferromagnet that is at the same time a multiferroic, small polarization magnetization, and you have a rather soft phase boundary, phase, uh, yeah, phase boundary in between a region of phase coexistence. It's a first order phase transition that gets you from one to the other state. What is really interesting, remarkable about this compound is if you look at the uh, order parameter for these two phases, the multiferroic and the non-multiferroic one, remember this is an antiferromagnetic order parameter. It's not a magnetization. Yeah? So this is no magnetic moments here, order parameter. So in this uh, high temperature, higher, at higher temperature phase, your order parameter points along, uh, well, let's say the vertical axis. So either in up or in down direction. And when you go through a domain wall from one to the other domain state, then you have a rotation of this order parameter across the domain wall. The remarkable property about this material is the state right in the center of the domain wall would then be a horizontal orientation of your antiferromagnetic order parameter. But that is exactly the ordered state in the low temperature phase. So the center of the domain wall kind of contains the core or the seed for the other domain state. So you go from here to there, and then in principle, the domain can grow out of the center of the domain wall in this state and the other way around. In the low temperature state, the high temperature state can grow out of the center of the domain wall in the low temperature phase. Uh, systems like that have been considered um, many years ago. There's a um, um, Hamilton operator for describing uh, states like that, basically by gradient terms for the domain walls and uh, anisotropy terms for the orientation of the uh, order parameter. Uh, you indeed find that there can be a region where the two states coexist. So here's the low temperature or high temperature state. Here's the low temperature state. And then there is a region where basically you can have both. And in particular, you can have a domain wall of one state becoming the domain of the opposite state. So that has been discussed, but there is no, no real observation yet of such kind of transition, no spatially resolved domain patterns. So we went ahead and did this. So this is our dysprosium terbium ferrite in the yeah, high temperature phase. So we are here. Uh, you see the two multifluoric domains. So antiferromagnetism with a small magnetization and polarization that gets you the domain contrast. This is done with Faraday rotation. Now we change the temperature, we reduce it. And from the domain wall, you suddenly get a gray region, no Faraday rotation. So it seems that out of this domain wall here, between two multiferroic domain regions, an antiferromagnetic phase starts to grow. It's exactly this pattern. So the center orientation in the domain wall becomes the new domain. You can then uh, continue that up to higher temperature. So if you increase the temperature further, then in the, in the end, the entire sample will be gray. And you have one domain wall separating uh, two antiferromagnetic domain states. So which is, it's a bit small, but here all, this, all the order parameter arrows are pointing to the right. Here they are pointing to the left. So here you would have a domain wall, and the center of the domain wall should be the other phase, so the multifluoric one. So what you expect to have here is antiferromagnetic bulk order 
with a multiferroic domain wall. We cannot resolve this multiferroic domain wall, so it's a speculation that it is there, but what we can do is we can now increase the temperature again, then this domain wall should become a domain again, and it does. So indeed, there seems to be a multiferroic domain wall in between two antiferromagnetic domains. Of course, this is indirect proof. We just heat it up, and then the state is gone, and we conclude that this must come from, an anti from a multiferroic domain wall. It would be nicer to have a more direct proof. So what we could also do is, if this is really a multiferroic domain wall, so with a small magnetization and polarization, in between zero magnetized and zero polarized antiferromagnetic domains, we should be able to apply a magnetic field and just act on the magnetization in the wall and make it broader. So that's what we tried. We kept the temperature low, so no reason for the sample to go into this uh, multiferroic state, but we applied a magnetic field in order to act on the magnetization in the suspected multiferroic domain wall. And indeed, a, a multiferroic domain wall appears to grow. So it, the magnetic field favors the magnetization in the wall, so it grows, even though you are still in the state where, in principle, you should not have the multiferroic order. You should also be able to do this with an electric field because the multiferroic wall is not only magnetized, it's also polarized. So we take another sample, heat it up, and yes, indeed. So we can also, with an electric field, we can convert this suspected multiferroic domain wall by acting on its polarization into a ferroelectric domain. So uh, we can apparently now convert a multiferroic state between a domain wall and bulk, so between two and three dimensions in a, in, in a way. Um, there is another interesting aspect about this, which is also at the same time a feature that is interesting to discuss about antiferromagnets. So here we have these uh, two multiferroic domains, or three rather. So we have a plus and a minus magnetized one. So a minus magnetized one in between two plus magnetized bubble-like regions. We apply a magnetic field, we favor this magnetization here, and we uh, therefore we have uh, these, these domains grow. And in the end they will meet, and the question is how do they meet? So what, what is there in the meeting point? Do they coalesce or not? And then we realize that any antiferromagnetic or even multiferroic domain, any domain has uh, a degree of freedom that we hadn't been aware of uh, up to that point. Namely, the order parameter across such a domain wall, it can rotate with one or the other helicity. So you can get from here to there, you can get either by doing this or by doing that. Of course, you have this degree of freedom, but we hadn't realized it so far. So here we seem to have both scenarios. So we have a clockwise rotation of the antiferromagnetic order parameter in this domain wall, and a counterclockwise one, no, another clockwise one in that domain wall. When they meet, then you get a 360 degree rotation. So you get a kind of 360 degree wall. So the order parameter makes a 360 full rotation, and that's a stable object. You could call it, um, um, an antiferromagnetic 1D skirmin, if you like. But in the end, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a 360-degree domain wall. The opposite case, so uh, clockwise rotation of the order parameter here, counterclockwise there, then they just annihilate, because these, these two then just cancel each other out, and you have a coalescence of these two bubbles. You can see it from the Faraday rotation. So here you have an even, if you integrate across this strip, you have an even distribution of your brightness of your Faraday rotation because they coalesce. And here you have this 360 degree domain wall. Uh, here you would not get any Faraday rotation contributions. So you have a small dip in the net Faraday rotation. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really something that we found quite interesting. And we are now talking to soft matter people who have the equivalence of that uh, in, in, in their squishy stuff and we are trying to find uh, a common ground and interest, some interesting stuff that is applicable in both uh, communities. <clears throat> okay, um, I think I, I gave you a couple of examples now. First, I'm motivated why, why is antiferromagnetism special with respect to magnetoelectrics? 
uh, because it, it, it's, it is more favorable for having this twofold symmetry breaking, spatial inversion, temporal inversion symmetry that you need for having magnetoelectric coupling effects. Not for all of them, but I would say at least it's favorable to have magnetoelectric coupling effects. And then I discussed a couple of examples um, where you can somehow find interesting new phenomena or new types of order, new types of antiferromagnetism, not necessarily directly related uh, to application, at least not as directly as many of the talks here in this workshop, but I think there's still, still room at the bottom. So uh, sooner or later, I'm, I'm quite convinced that some of these, these phenomena will be useful or some of these detection techniques. Um, what I always emphasize is that uh, nonlinear optics is a really useful technique here because it couples to the symmetry breaking that every ferroic state per definition has. Okay, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.